If you have your Bibles, we're in John 9. We want to welcome you to the Avenue Church. We're glad you're here. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and he washed and he came back seen. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is. Others, no, he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. I do not know. So here's the deal, guys, right? Jesus is doing his ministry. He's, he's preaching. He's healing. He's feeding miraculous stuff, all these awesome things, teaching about the kingdom of God. And then he happens upon this man who was born blind. And the theology of the day was if you had something wrong with you, you must have done something wrong to God. And so, and so the people around him wanted to investigate this idea of like, what did he do to cause this? Jesus is like, I'm not, that's not where we're going. We're not camping out in the minutia of, of, these, of these lesser arguments as to why this guy had this or that. The world is broken, sin is here, and bad stuff happens. Here's what Jesus does. He takes it right to God's purposes in the blindness. He's, he's not so much focused on the why, but what God is going to do. As I was reading commentary, that was one of the points brought out in this particular passage, what is God going to do in the midst of this guy's blindness? And so here's what Jesus does. Um, he, he looks at him and, and, and he, he spits on the ground. He makes this, uh, this mud out of, out of uh, the, the, the dust and the dirt that was there, puts it on his eyes, and he tells the guy to, to go and wash. He sends him to this, this place um, that's called Siloam. Now, it's an interesting way that Jesus heals this guy because oftentimes Jesus would heal by touching or sometimes Jesus wouldn't even go into the house. His power and his authority was such that he could just say, be healed and people would be healed. But this time, you know, he heals in this like kind of peculiar way. It was very like personal and unique and um, it had actually required continuing faith of the guy who had the mud on his eyes because had he stayed there with mud on his eyes, not only would he have looked ridiculous, but he wouldn't have been healed. He actually had to respond to Jesus's invitation to, to, to activate what God wanted to do in his life. Do you see there's two parts there? It was like, I'm, I'm doing this, I'm inviting you to respond, and then he responds. And he goes, so there's a level of faith that was required for him to go. Now Jesus, we know, theologically is the one who not only gives the healing, but also gives the faith to respond. But don't miss, don't miss the fact that there's, there's two parties at play here. So not everyone's happy, though, with, with the response. Not everyone's happy with the healing because the guy comes back and they're questioning, like, is this the guy? I'm not, I'm not sure. Is this, is this who, who we used to see here? And, and um, they get after him and they ask him these questions. And, and, and I love the guy's answer. He's, he's one of my heroes in the New Testament because he doesn't know that much. I love guys who don't know that much. I also love guys who struggle. Those are, those are two, two of my favorite guys. This guy doesn't know that. And, and when they ask him, they're kind of upset because Jesus was like changing things around in, in that culture. He was, he was talking about a new kingdom that he was bringing in and people didn't love that. And so when he gives credit to Jesus, 
um, the, the, the people are, are upset and they, and they, they give some pushback and, and then they, they ask, well, where is he? And the guy's like, I don't know. I, I don't know where Jesus is. He just told me to go to this place and, and, and then I went. And then if you look down a little bit further in the passage, his answers um, continue. Uh, at some point he calls him a, a prophet. So first he, he's like the man named Jesus and then he calls him a prophet. And then if you go down to um, verse 25, you'll see this. So the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner, referring to Jesus. This is verse 25. He answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that I was blind and now I see. I don't know this Jesus guy. I mean, for all I know, he like spit on me. And then he sent me to this place called Salome, which means sent. And it was actually a, 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 a structure that had been built that held water. And the water was then sent into the city. The guy goes and washes there, comes back and he can see. He doesn't know where Jesus is. He doesn't know much about Jesus. All he knows is that he was like this at one point in life. And now he's like this. And the only person he can give credit to is Jesus. That's all he knows. That's all I know. I love the simplicity of what God does here in this particular story. As I was thinking about story, I was thinking about our sort of our place at the table. We talked last week uh, as we began this new series about uh, our place at the table. And, and we realized that Christianity doesn't have the same place that it's always had, Right? I mean, it, it, let, let's just have a, um, a moment of, of reality here. Uh, if you were to turn the clocks back 60 years ago, 70 years ago, the church, um, pastors, Christians, that meant something different than it does today. And, and what that means is that not that, not that, that um, uh, captures us or it confines us, it just helps us to function in reality. And it's always the best place to start, right? Let's start in reality. And the reality is we still have a place at the table, but it's not the place that we once had. We don't just come in and say, hey, this is the way things should be. And all of a sudden, the majority of the world says, oh, yeah, you're right, because that's what the church says. No, this is a, this is a culture of, of pluralism, where there's many seats at the table. This is a, a culture of, of secularism. Where, where it's like, I got to feel it and touch it. It's got to be somewhat horizontal. And even in the midst of, of the secular desire, there's a secret longing for the mysterious, for, for uh, the transcendent. And we see that in art and we see that in music and people's love and affinity for that. And, and that doesn't mean the truth is compromised. It doesn't mean that we still don't um, have and share the way, the truth, and the life. But the way we do it has to be intelligent, and in the, in the context of reality for 2019. And one of, the, one of the places that we can really step into the table is in the place of story. The place of story. Everyone loves story. As a matter of fact, everyone at the table is allowed to have a story. And so what I want us to see today is we have a real opportunity, as did this guy who was born blind, to enter into our stories, bring it to the table, and make much of Jesus. Let's be wise and equipped and empowered to do that because there is a world out there that still has given us a place at the table, and the most loving thing for us to do is to step into that place and be prepared to share our story. So that's what we're going to look at uh, here today. And, and so we're going, to, uh, we're going to walk through this in, in sort of uh, what we would call uh, God's story forming. But I wanted to look at a quote. If you guys have your bulletins, uh, the, the quote's in there, and we always provide an outline. Well, most times we provide an outline uh, for you guys. And um, it helps you to kind of uh, keep up throughout the week and maybe think about some things and, and maybe even keeps you kind of following along here and uh, and so we're going we're gonna to put that quote up there. Um, this, is a, this is a quote from, from Jeff Vanderstelt, uh, pastor and uh, author and writer. And this is what he has to say. Every follower of Jesus has a story to tell. And it's a story about God and his grace. However, 
Many of us have not been equipped to tell our story in such a way that points to Jesus as the hero. I'm, you don't need to raise your hands, but I'm wondering how many of you can relate to that. Like you could tell your story, you know the details of who you were and who you are now, but you don't feel very equipped at the end of your story that Jesus would be the hero of it. It still might be you as the hero, or it still might be your church as the hero, or it still might be your sponsor as the hero. All people who played an important role in this. But what, what we're looking at here is trying to equip you guys with being able to tell your story in such a way where Jesus is the hero as you tell your story. It's an awesome way of evangelism. Check this out. As those who want to show and share Jesus every day, it's imperative that we learn to talk about him through the medium of our stories. Like we, we, we have to understand this. Why? Why? Often telling our story will be the most natural way to talk to our not yet believing friends about Jesus. If you are here and you believe that Jesus has done for you what he's done for, for this man born blind, if you're one who believes uh, that Jesus has, he's allowed you to see, he's brought you um, life, that, that you understood yourself to be a sinner and that you had no hope outside of Jesus, like, like God should and was rightful to separate himself and bring a, and bring like a, a penalty against your sin. And you, you understood that, that God, he put it on Jesus instead of you. And Jesus died in your place and on the third day came, came back and, and overcame your sin and overcame your death. If you are that person here today, then you have a story to tell. And you have friends that need to hear that story. Because the day you put your faith in Christ, the day you turn from yourself and your former ways, and you're like, you, you began to rest in Christ, although you didn't even know much about him, was the day you were forgiven, set free, given a new heart. Amen. It's what we invite you into every Sunday here at the Avenue Church. And so uh, if that's you, you have friends that need to hear your story. They need to, and, and some of the way, some of the most effective way that they're going to hear your story is, is by you telling it. Not by, not by you bringing them to church. It's totally cool if you want to bring them to church. It's awesome. I'm so happy to see you guys. And I will tell the gospel story every weekend. So, you know, as long as the Lord helps me to do so. But your story can often be like more powerful and more effective because they know you. They can see the Jesus in you rather than this guy who just gets excited and, you know, Run, walks around and yells a lot. Amen. So I have, I have multiple kids now. My, my family's growing, and um, I, I just wanted to briefly tell you about two of those children as it pertains to stories. I have a 17-year-old who knows how to tell a really good story. She can talk about her emotion. Um, she can talk about the facts. She can talk about the details of the story. Like, um, you know, she... She can, really, she can really tell a good story. And at the end of the story, you can, you can know what happened. You can be like, okay, I, I got it. Well, I, I really feel connected to your story. I also um, have a four-year-old, a little boy, who can also tell a really good story. It's just not true. <laughs> so I can ask him about school. School was awesome. And, and this is kind of um, how it might go. Uh, school was awesome and... Um, you know, uh, I, I played with my buddy Dominic, and um, you know, uh, eyeball, eyeball, eyeball. Uh, that's his new word now. He just he just randomly says it. I don't know what's up with it. Eyeball, and uh, I'm hungry. Um, <laughs> and we went to recess, and uh, and eyeball, by the way, is in place of other words that are less appropriate. Just so you know. So we're like, we're, that's a lesser evil for him right now. Um, eyeball, eyeball. Um, Cora hit me, and where are we going? That's fun. So, so that would be his like recount of his day. And so we, 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 have, we have two versions of storytelling. We've got like a four-year-old version and a 17-year-old version. I'm just, I'm just praying that God brings us somewhere in the middle of that by the end of today. That we would be able to learn. We don't have to be radically proficient, but that we would be able to, to learn how to tell our stories in such a way based on what God tells us here that Jesus becomes the hero. Is that cool? Yeah. All right, let me, let me pray into that. And we're going to break this down a little bit more. Uh, Father, we pray that you would fill us with your spirit. God, that uh, we just invite your spirit here. We pray that you would uh, just fill us with your confidence, your goodness, and your grace as we look to your word, and that you would call people to your name throughout this whole time. In Christ's name, amen. amen. 
All right, telling our stories in light of God's story. Uh, you would have to know God's story first to understand how your story fits into that. God's story has four chapters. I'm going to briefly walk through the theme of all of the scripture. You ready? Here we go. First chapter is creation. God created everything. In chapter one, things are good. Things are uh, amazing. There's no sin. There's what you would call a uh, perfect harmony. There's peace between God and people, people and people. There's inner peace. There's no hurricanes. There's no tornadoes. It doesn't like, you know, we're not under, we're not having to board up or not. It's just kind of like everything is, is awesome. Chapter one. Chapter two in God's, in God's uh, story is fall. Is sin enters the world. Adam and Eve both find that uh, they, they believe, at least temporarily, that they can find their life outside of God. And so they choose outside of God. And when that happens, then the fall, that, that ushers in chapter two. And the fall is when everything breaks down. All those, all those harmonious pieces, they all break. So now we no longer have a peace with God. We're actually separated from God. We no longer have a peace within ourselves. Rather, rather we have anxiousness and, and depression and addiction and, and all the longings of our heart that used to be met in God, we, we look elsewhere for them. Um, we no longer have a peace with one another. Our relationships now, we, even though, even though like, there, there's marriages that last, there's still brokenness within those marriages. And, and it, it's just difficult uh, to do life. And we have hurricane season. And we have people born blind. And we have people who suffer with cancer. Um, we have people who, who, are, who are part of the brokenness of the fall. That's our reality. Chapter 3, God doesn't stop the story there. Redemption. God in his love for us, he sees the brokenness that we live in and he decides, man, I'm, I'm going to rescue and I'm going to renew. I'm not going to leave my people the way that they have chosen to live. And so he comes and he rescues us even when we didn't want to be rescued. And the way he does that is through Christ. And he, God, the, God the Son comes down and he lives this life of no sin. He actually, li that's why I think everyone was, was uh, like super upset or, or enticed by Jesus because he lived this life, life where there was no brokenness. He actually had perfect harmony with God. He had perfect harmony on the inside. He had perfect relationships as, as pertained, to, as it depended on him. And, and so he's living this life of no brokenness in the midst of brokenness. And people don't know what to do with it. And then he goes to a cross. And on the cross, he, he pays for our sin. He, he does the only thing that could bring any type of rescue to our brokenness by taking it upon himself and on the third day, after paying that price that would have separated us from God, he actually overcomes it. And he invites us into that redemptive chapter with God through faith and turning to him. And then the final chapter is, is renewal. R renewal is Jesus' promise that he's going to come back. And, and what, what he says here in renewal in this last chapter is that we're right now in chapter 3 of redemption, but there's a fourth chapter coming back when I'm going to renew all things. I'm going to remove sin. I'm going to remove death. I'm going to remove every tear. I'm actually going to use your sorrow and suffering of my people to turn it into joy and gladness. And he's going to dwell with his people in person here in a new earth. So that's, that's the story of God in those, in those four chapters. Uh, that, that's, that's what it looks like here. And so what we're going to do today is we're learning how do we tell our story in light of God's story? The, these being the handles for God's story. Well, well, let's look at how the guy does it. Now, understand that the guy doesn't really know who Jesus is yet. So, so this is a little bit of like um, putting it in a framework for you guys to see uh, so, that, so that you who know Jesus can really lean into this. Uh, this would be called a method, if you will, a method of storytelling, storytelling. Uh, so in, in chapter one, of creation. Uh, creation is all about identity and origin. Identity and origin. The same guy that you heard the quote from uh, is, is also uh, the same guy that provides much of this framework and helps us through seeing our story in this lens. So creation is about, all about uh, identity and origin. And so Adam and Eve had a great identity with God and they knew their origin was with God. Uh, when, when we're thinking about our story, uh, you, the, the first movement is thinking like, well, what where was I, what was like my creation story? What was my identity and origin um, kind of coming up, if you will? Uh, the, the question that we focus on when we begin to tell our stories with identity and origin is uh, who or what shaped me the most? Who or what shaped me the most? Now, all these things are going to be written in your outline if you want to reference them later and, and even like begin to jot some of these things down. Who or what um, shaped me the most? 
in this particular story, you can see it. The guy says in verse 9, I am the man. I am the man. Now, I, I don't think it was like, like smack talk. You know, like, I don't think he was like, like, you know, I am the man in coming in like that. People were trying to uh, identify who this guy was. And one of the first things they try to identify this guy with was his origin and his identity, which was a guy born what? Blind. So he identifies with, with his, his origin, with, his, with who he used to be. He's like, that was me. I'm that dude. Blind. Yes. So we see that he references his creation as he begins to unfold his story. Well, the, the second movement here is, is the fall. And the fall is all about brokenness and blame. And, and, you know, because in the garden, when we see God's story uh, begin to unfold through Adam and Eve, we see that there's a lot of brokenness and blame going on. And so when you start thinking about chapter two of your story, um, we need to think about like, what are some of the things that I did to try to fix what was wrong with me? Like, what, what were some of my um, attempts at trying to get back to creation. And for this guy, uh, we're, we're actually using the same verse because uh, it says he was the, the man born blind, which refers to who he used to be. But then it also, they also asked this question, and you were begging, right? And so he was, there, there was a sense where he was begging. He was trying to um, survive. This was his, his best attempt at survival. And so we see that not only is he the man because that's how he was created and that's kind of how he brought, was brought up. That was the most identifying thing about his youth and even into however old he is in this passage. But we also begin to see that, yeah, like I'm the guy who used to beg too. Like even though there's like shame and and guilt and, and some, some and remember in this culture, you were thought of as sinful if you were blind, much less a beggar. But this guy relates to, to him. He's like, yeah, that was me. I used to be blind, yes, and I used to beg. This is what I used to do to try to save myself, to try to work out my own brokenness. And then we look, we look at redemption here in this particular story, and we see rescue and deliverance. Now, now check these verses out. I love these verses here. This is a chapter of this guy's story uh, where he begins to highlight the fact that, that he's been rescued. This is what he says. The one they called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and I washed and I received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I don't know. Let's leave it there just for one second. If you could go back, thank you. I like this um, passage because there's details in this passage. Understand that this guy has details in every part of his story. Details matter. If I were to tell you a story of my children and I didn't include eyeball and I'm hungry and I just said like, hey, you know, oh, well, that might be the child I'm talking about. But if I said my four-year-old uh, sometimes, you know, creates his stories and I just moved on, you'd be like, you wouldn't have connected to it. But because there's details in the story, you connect. When we tell our story, we have to tell it with some detail. We have to be able to recount what was going on. So he recounts, this is, this is, what, this is all I know about Jesus. They call him Jesus. I don't, and, and for me, he's just kind of a man at this point. And, he, and he, this is what he did. He made some mud and he put it on my eyes. Detail, detail. And this is what he told me to do. He told me to go and wash. And so I went and, and I received my sight. And they said, where is he? And he's like, I don't know. I can't tell you more about him. Hey, let me just do a brief translation. I was really struggling. And, um, you know, like the pain inside, even though no one could see it, it was like, it was like chains. It was like I was bound up. And then somebody uh, invited me to... Uh, come to the Avenue Church, and at the Avenue Church, I met people who received me. And it was weeks because I thought, I thought it was kind of weird at the beginning, but I liked the cold brew, so I kept coming. And, um, you know, and the music was awesome, and all, you know, and so, you know, I just, I didn't understand what he was saying, but he, like everyone seemed really excited about this Jesus guy. And then one Sunday, I felt like I should come forward and like pray to receive Jesus. I don't even know what that means. But I, but I, did know that I was a sinner and I, and I needed Jesus as my savior. And I, and I knew that Jesus had the freedom that I couldn't find anywhere. So I came forward and I prayed and like in that moment, 
it was cool. It wasn't like angels sung over me and, and I, you know, I, I floated out of here. But something shifted. And I began to, began to want to like, look into the things of God. And I began to feel a, a growing freedom that I've never had before. And I began to pray and, and love began to rise in my heart. And I began to believe what they were teaching about my forgiveness and freedom comes from Christ. And I'm still walking through that today. I don't know much more about Jesus, but I know that happened. Where is he? He said, I don't, I don't know. Next passage, please. He continues his, <laughs> his theological discussion of Jesus. Because remember, they were challenging him. They're like, I think Jesus is a sinner. That's how he did this. And this is what he says. Whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. I love people who don't know. You know people who scare me? Who know everything. When I get around people who always have an answer for my questions, I'm, I get, I don't know if it's just me and my people pleasing or what, but I get like a little bit intimidated. And, and then, I mean, I, I guess it depends on how like aggressive they come in at me. But, but when, when you're around somebody who always seems to have to have the last word or who always seems to have to win the argument and they're just like, hey, well, let's just agree to disagree. Translation, I'm right, sucker. See ya. <laughs> and then I'm done talking to you. We're done with this. Okay. When, when you get around people like that, it's like a hard way to translate the love and mercy of Jesus from them, I think at times. But when you get around people who are like, I mean, I don't know. I don't know why my best friend buried a baby two weeks ago. I don't know. I mean, I know that there's sin in the world and there's brokenness, but I don't know why that child and not mine. And I don't know why my mom's at home and crazy back pain. I don't know why I got a prayer request to pray for uh, Crystal Barwis for, uh, for her cancer, who's a local Delray ma mail carrier. I don't know. I, you know, we prayed for healing this week. I don't know why they're still not all healed. I don't know. But I do know that Jesus is still radically good Amen. and kind in the midst of all that. That's right. Well, he doesn't stop with redemption. Um, he, he moves on to, to, to renewal. The question that you're thinking about in redemption, though, um, as it pertains to your story, is how has Christ rescued me and, like, set me free from who I used to be? Renewal, final chapter uh, of this guy's story. Hope and future. Hope and a future. That's kind of the theme of renewal. This is what he says um, in verse 32. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Now, it's not a full out like, I know this guy is coming back to wipe away every tear and, and remove all sin and suffering and use it for good. It's none of that. Here's, here's his hope, ready? He's like, basically, what he did to me is, is something I could never do to myself. There's something mysterious and unexplainable about it, and I love it. And, and my thought is, if he can do this for me, there's probably more good coming. Like, that's his hope and renewal, as basic as that is. He's like, man, Jesus now, and then probably Jesus then. Never since the world has begun. Has anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind? The question that we're kind of focusing on uh, through, through your story as you begin to retell your story is, is, is who or what is the focus now of your life since Christ has redeemed you, since he's rescued you through his cross? Like what does your life look like now as you begin to more and more focus on the person of Jesus? And so what I wanted to do uh, in our time remaining is, is simply... Uh, do a little practice. We want to be a practicing community. We don't just want to be a listening community. This is not a time for you to just come and absorb. This is a time for God to engage you and then sometimes for you to actually kind of practice some of your skills that he wants to give you. Remember, your lost friends who don't know Jesus, who think you're crazy, their greatest hope is the Holy Spirit. Behind the Holy Spirit, somewhere is your story. And so it's imperative upon you 
out of love for God and, and love, love for them to learn how to tell your story. And so uh, this, again, I referenced the outline because I have all these questions there um, printed out for you. And, and you might just want to be jotting down what you think of as I ask these questions again, as it pertains to your story. So let's, let's, check, let's check it out. Creation. Who or what has shaped your understanding of self? Uh, what I thought I would do uh, is just kind of briefly tell you my story so that you would have an example of what it looks like. Your stories don't have to be long, okay? You know, more popular than sermons that are 45 minutes are TED Talks that are 12, okay? So the briefer, the better, right? And so your story, like, details, but get to the point, right? And so creation, who or what has shaped your understanding of yourself? So I was born into an awesome home where my parents were learning to love Jesus more and more, and I received a lot of affection um, I received a lot of affirmation, protection. It was just a great place to grow up and to be known. We did sports. We did all sorts of things together. And um, my understanding of myself uh, was that, you know, uh, I, I, belonged, I belonged to this family. And um, part of the way that my understanding of myself began to shift a little bit is that I think I began to believe the lie that if I behaved well, things worked out well, okay? So, so my, my creation was good. My parents were awesome. My fall, beginning at the sort of end of my, my, when I would talk about my creation, was that I began to take the affection and the love and, the, and all the good stuff of my parents, and I began to make it like my God. I began to make it something that seemed like I needed and that uh, I couldn't lose. And, and so my understanding of myself was that this is a safe place and I loved it and all these sort of things. But, but my brokenness began to come out when I started to think, man, I could lose this and I desperately don't want to lose it. And so that would lead me into, my, into fall, right? And so uh, how did you try to fix your brokenness? Well, I tried to fix my brokenness by like being the best little boy you ever did see. <laughs> Where's dad? Dad. You say jump, I'm like, how high? Well, because I, I couldn't afford to lose my, my lifeline. And, and so this is about kind of my own heart that takes something that's really good and begins to make it something that's ultimate. And anytime you do that, you have an idol on your hands. So this isn't about my parents. This is about the brokenness of what I did with something good. And so what did I do to fix my brokenness? Well, I just got to work, man. I just started grinding. I love to grind. It like makes me feel like I'm doing something about it. Let me sweat out my salvation and I'll feel much better about life. Like, and I don't have to always be in control. I just have to maintain by my efforts the good that I've been given. And the more I realized how good of, of the affection and the love, the more I realized how much I, I, I loved that and needed it, the more I began to fear I would lose it. And thus began, I think, my walk with anxiousness. Because the result of not being able to always have your idol is you either become angry or, or you become super obsessed and worried about it. And so I went that route. So how did I try to fix my brokenness? I just tried to be amazing all the time. And, and then I actually translated that into how God related to me, which is super exhausting, by the way. Next slide, please. Redemption. How has Jesus redeemed and rescued you by his death on the cross? Well, when I was 13 years old, man, I went to this church called Spanish River, which planted us. Thank you, Spanish River Online. We love you guys. Can we give it up for Spanish River Church? Love you guys. 13 years old, I started hearing about a, a, a sin problem that I had and a savior who, who was named Jesus, who was like, man, I'm your guy. You need me and you want me, come and get me. So I did. I was like 13, okay, that sounds awesome. And I, I began this walk with God where I put my faith in his finished work and I just started living life now different, but I had this new heart and I started like in bite-sized pieces, 
just wanting to read Scripture more, or thinking that was something good to do. And, uh, I, you know, I, my, my eyes were open. I just started seeing life through Jesus as my center, as opposed to Casey as my center. And um, he began to redeem and rescue me uh, specifically, not just my sin problem, but also that brokenness that I told you about, that, that approval and that, the, the, the anxiousness that drives me, the, the anxiousness being the result of that. He began to rescue me from that. He began to say, no, 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 no. You don't, you don't need the approval of others. You can rest in what I've given you. It is enough. The approval of others will come and it will go. I will never leave you nor forsake you. There, there's no weapon formed against you, Casey, that shall prosper. There's nothing that, that, will, that will separate you from my love. Like, like whoever, whoever the, the Father has in his hands, he will not lose. Perfect love casts out fear. And, and as I began and continue to walk with Jesus, I began to actually feel as though I was rescued from that and freed from that. And I began to be able to take steps in areas and do things that, that like young Casey and early Casey would have never done, all because of Christ, what he's done for me and through me. And then finally, renewal. Where's your hope today? Where is your hope today, guys? And so my hope today is in the fact that Jesus is coming back and that although this is happening, it is definitely not happening according to my timetable. Like, I want that renewed mind and that, and that renewed heart that never wanders right now. I love, I love Jesus and I love pursuing him. I love him as my treasure, but I also love the comforts of this world. I also still look for your approval. I also, when I'm preaching, will see your face and think thoughts while words are coming out of my mouth, sometimes about what you're thinking or who you are, and then I'll have, I'll have an inner dialogue while this message is going on because I saw you. <laughs> so that's true. And I pretty much hate it. And Sundays after I preach is not the best time because I just feel like it happened again. And it could be a me, it could be whatever. Like it happens throughout the week and like it's, it's like, ah, uh, like come on, Lord. I know this is true. I know you've redeemed and you've rescued me from that former self. Why do I have a propensity to, to I, not as much, but why do I have a propensity to go back to where I used to live? And you know what he's been whispering to me lately? I'm leaving that thorn in your side, at least right now, because it's your bridge to me. And in your pain point, I become ridiculously real. Not through your awesome victory, not through your, hey, this is completely God. I don't even remember that old dude. No, through your, dang, God, this seems... Slow, man. Is this even working? And then he gets to whisper to me, it's working. And there's one day, there's one day when I come back and I will renew this time completely. So don't bet it all on this life because there's one to come where you will get everything and more that you long for. So keep your eyes on me now and for that day. Amen. All right, yeah, cool, awesome. Now listen, I know you're clapping because hopefully I made Jesus the hero of my story. And if you see anything about my life that you think's like, oh, that's kind of cool, it's definitely Jesus doing it. And so as, as we think about your story, and, and what you guys are, are, would be thinking through, man, what I want you to do and what, I, what I'm hoping uh, you, you to do is to be asking those questions that I provided for you under creation. What, what used to define your origin and identity? Who were you coming up? Or who were you as a teenager? Whatever, back then. Uh, and, and then uh, how, how did that break down? How did that not work out for you? And what did that look like? Even a couple of sentences. Like, it's important to it's like important to write your story out, I think, even if it's in bullet points. Almost like you would prepare for something. You want to prepare for the moments that God gives to you. So creation, who was I? Fall, how did I, how did I like try to find my best life now outside of Jesus? And what did that look like? Redemption, 
Well, how did Jesus save you? I mean, you once were blind and dead, and now you got your arms up on Sunday. What is that all about? Just tell, just tell some details about that. Make sure that as you're telling details about that, Jesus is on the cross and out of the grave. If you tell your story and you're not clear somewhere in the redemption chapter of your story to put your, your rescue and your redemption with Jesus dying for your sin and overcoming it through his resurrection, credit will go elsewhere. It'll go to this church. You don't want it at this church. We're, we will mess it up. We can't handle that pressure. It'll go to me. It'll go to your spot. It'll go to somewhere else. Make sure in the, it's like, hey, this happened and it was because Jesus went to a cross in my place and I understood that and I believe he overcame my sin, my suffering, my shame, my approval needs and so now can I. And then, and then, and then think through the renewal part. What are you, what are you, what's your hope, man? It can't be that you're going to be perfect on this side of heaven or you will be hopeless. Your hope has to be both in Christ now but both in Christ to come. And talk about, like, what are you looking forward to? I think sometimes that's the best part of the gospel that we never share. It's like Christ died and, and, and rose again. That's awesome. But people, he's coming back. Like, don't think it's all for now. You have to understand. It would be like your favorite treasure leaving, and all you can do is remember the time you had. Listen, you're going to get more time with him. And when you have that time, it's not going to be through cancer. It's not going to be through addiction. It's not going to be through divorce. It's going to be through perfect harmony. That's good news, people. And we have to remember that it's coming our way. The New Testament says soon. I don't know. I'm not trying to, like, guess. I just, soon, I like that. I like that. So here's where we end. Your story. Um, I was just asking God, like, so, okay, so this was a bit maybe, um, I, I don't think academic. I don't know that any of my messages are ever academic, but like, this was a bit, there's some teaching here. I was trying to get you guys to a place. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish up with, with just a little bit of preaching, and then we're going we're gonna to go into communion. It won't be long, trust me. I remember, I said TED Talks, so I got it. Here's what I think Jesus wanted you to hear. Your story, first of all, is beautiful. I don't know if you know that. Your story is really beautiful. Here's, here's what I believe. I believe that there are quite a few of you who brought in today stories that you would not want to share publicly, that you're ashamed over, that you maybe are still currently living right now and struggling through. And I don't, I don't know if anyone in a while has told you that your story is just captivatingly beautiful. You need to hear that. You need to hear that from the heart of God. Your story is beautiful to him. It doesn't matter what your parents think. It doesn't matter what, what, your, what your groups think. It doesn't matter what work thinks about your story. Your story is it's captivating, man. And there is an author and a finisher of your story named Jesus if you are a follower, if he's, if he's calling you, that's writing out your story and is like exceedingly glad to watch it unfold. All of you are, would be familiar with the, with the example of like a child that brings you something that it doesn't mean anything to anybody else. But, but when Cora brings me these scribbles, I'm like, that is an amazing, what is it, baby? Heart. Yes, I love it. I get that your life seems like, like Scrabble. And, and scribbles. But there's a God who's like, that is so, I love it. Guys, guys, look. It's Mike, it's Joe, it's Susan, it's David. L look. Remember when eternity passed when we began to write this story and we, we planned it all out? Look at it unfold. So awesome. Your story is not only beautiful, it's also powerful. Your story is is more powerful, I think, than you realize. Do you know that as a Christ follower, as somebody like the man who was born blind who now sees, like, the Holy Spirit lives in you? What that means is that the, Jesus calls himself the living hope. The, the living hope, the Holy Spirit, it lives in you. So every time you tell your story with Jesus as the hero, people get around a supernatural power named Jesus. 
I, I don't, it doesn't matter if you're good at telling your story or not. It doesn't matter if you can tell your story like I did or you stumble through it or, you know, it, it, it doesn't matter. Once you open up people to the hero of your story, supernatural things can take place. So it's like you've got this radical power living inside you. And when you begin to tell your story and invite other people to hear your story, you're inviting them not to you, but to the living hope that has, that has made you who you are today. Your story is incredibly powerful. I'm going to ask our team to come up and we're going to get prepared for communion. And as they come up, I want you to understand something. There are some of you here who know your story is powerful. You know, you tell it in rooms. You've got people who have heard it and they love to hear it and they invite you to. That's cool. There are other people here who are like, my story doesn't matter. I, there was, there's no big like, I was super dark like the prodigal and now I've got super light. As a matter of fact, I just kind of grew up in the church and I put my faith in Christ and now I'm living for Jesus. Do you know that there are people out there who have to hear that Jesus saves both the younger and the older brother? His power is for the prodigal. And like last week we talked about, I mean, he runs to the prodigal, but he also goes out to the older brother. He also goes out to the older brother who is saving himself or herself through their religious behavior and actions. And if that's you, man, you were just as dead as the younger brother and Jesus paid just as much for you as he did them. And your story is powerful to those who need to hear it, who have never experienced the bottom of their barrel. There are some people who have never come to the end of their rope. They haven't hit bottom, but they still need Jesus. They have to hear that Jesus is for people who bottom out, but he's also for people who like rock minivans and have mortgages and like have steady jobs their whole life. And you know, like, like do, do this thing, do like the American quote dream and have something, something point kids. And like Jesus is for everybody. So don't demote your story. It's offensive to Jesus. The last one is your, your story is not your own. Your story, it's just not your own. The scriptures say you were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. But honor God with everything. I just, in, in all love, you don't have the right to keep your story untold. It's not your story. Jesus wants to save people. He came to seek and save the lost and he wants to use you in your story. I believe to do it and my prayer was that today you would be sent as evangelists like never before to tell your story to at least one person this week that's never heard your story. It's not your story. It's, it's, not, it's not your story to, to hoard and to keep and to just keep in Christian circles. The world is waiting to hear your story. And it's my encouragement that you would be sent today to tell your story and believe in the power of the hero of your story, not the storyteller. Because this is how the story ends for this dude. Jesus heard that he had cast him out and having found him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? That's Jesus. That's his messiahship. It's the fact that he's the coming king. The guy answered, and who is he, sir? That I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, you have seen him and it is I that is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe and he worshiped him. If you want to get better at telling your story, fill those questions out, get some, get some thought to it. But the, the way you get best at telling your story is by worshiping the hero of your story. That's exactly what this guy did. And that's exactly what we're going to do. And so as we turn our time now to communion, uh, I'm going to let you come to the tables. There's, there's a table back there, there's a table here, there's a table back there, wherever you're sitting, whatever's closest to you, you'll, you'll grab, a, grab a, uh, a glass of juice and a, and a cracker and, uh, and we'll, we'll all take together. What communion is, is it's worship to this Jesus. Communion is a reminder and a refreshment of what is happening, has happened and will happen. The, the bread represents Christ's body broken for us. The juice represents his blood given to us and poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. And, and when we take it, we're reminded that Christ died for us and rose again, but we're also reminded, Paul says, that he's coming back. So this refreshes us spiritually because it's a great reminder that it doesn't depend on us. And it's a great reminder that our hero is not yet done. 
And so communion is for all believers, people who profess Christ. Um, if that's not you, totally cool. Please stay and just think and, and process and just kind of watch what happens is what, what Christians do to celebrate their hero. This is one of the things that we do throughout the centuries since Christ has, has left. This unites the church. The scriptures also say to take in a worthy manner. So I'm going to give you a moment to reflect upon your heart. If you find sin that God brings up in your heart, confess it, repent it, and then come. If you, have, if you find areas that you're hardened in, don't come. Let, let it pass this time and, and ask God to do a work in your heart so that next time you would come as a surrendered vessel. But all of you who are desperate and hungry for Jesus, this, this is our meal. You'll hear a song that's actually played over you can think about it, process it, sing it back, whatever you want, and then I'll come back and we'll take communion together. Let's take a moment. Father, thank you for the opportunity to come and celebrate this meal that you left us with. You tell us to examine ourselves in a worthy, and see that we come in a worthy manner. We know that that would mean that we're a professing believer and a believer that is pursuing you. That's not holding any area captive in our hearts. So God, I pray that you would make clear if that's, if if there's one area, if there's something that needs to be confessed to you. God, we confess that we indeed are sinners and in need of a savior, and that's why we come and we, we surrender our lives afresh to you as we partake of this meal. In Christ's name. Amen. You may come. Amen. So on the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this, this is going to be broken. It's going to, it's going to be like my body for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and eat. And on the same night, he took the cup and he poured it out. And he said, just like my blood will be poured out for the forgiveness of your sin, the remission of your sin, so too is this poured out. The Apostle Paul says it's not just looking back, it's looking forward to what he will accomplish in that day. And so we take and drink with that in mind. And normally we enter right into prayer, and I'm going to dismiss you here in just a minute, but I thought it would be a mistake if we missed this moment. As we just celebrated the hero of our story, we have uh, a few people in our midst who, pub who went public with their hero named Jesus, and we got to baptize them yesterday. So if you were just baptized, would you stand up, please? stay standing. You guys stay standing. We're going we're gonna to pray for you as we close out. You guys stay standing. And I also heard um, that we have, we have a ton of people that are with us online today. Uh, and so I just want to say, hey, we're, we're praying for you. We love you. Thank you for engaging with us online today. And um, we just would invite you uh, to continue to be a part of this family, even if you can't be here right now. And so it's going to be a special moment for us as we pray for our, our, new, our new brothers and sisters in Christ, or, or even those who renewed uh, where they were. And let's pray. Father, thank you uh, for this moment. God, even as, even as we, we will extend a hand towards those who are standing, just go ahead, if you feel comfortable, extend a hand towards those who are standing. And we pray that you would fill them with your spirit, God, that their story would continue to be captured by you. And that as they worship you, Jesus, they, they would just naturally and intentionally make you the hero of their story as they share this with those around them. Lord God, would that be true of all of us, whether we're here or online, Father, I pray that this community called the Avenue Church, which is so diverse and looks so different, I pray that the one thing that unifies us would be that we make much of the name of Jesus because he first loved us. And so, Father, we thank you for this communion moment. We worship you. And over God's people, I declare his promises that he will meet you and he will make his face to shine upon you and he will give you his peace. Lord Jesus, I pray these things in your name. Amen and amen.